So welcome folks, great to have you with us. Um, it's my pleasure to do this session, Ian McInnes from TF Under Course. So, um, deliver us from doing harm, helping without hurting, that's our topic for today. So let's think about this, in trying to help others in need, we might be doing more harm than good. We may not even know we're doing it. <clears throat> we see a need, God touches our heart, and before we know it, we're knee deep in organizing something, uh, a container of goods to the latest Pacific cyclone a collection of clothing or soft toys to a flood victim somewhere, wiring money to some faraway charity that's moved us with a tearjerker of an ad, joining our church perhaps on a trip to an orphanage somewhere, or simply repackaging meals for your local food bank. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. Let me share a story with you. When the tsunami in the Indian Ocean slammed into Sri Lanka in 2004, I was holidaying there with my Sri Lankan born wife. Now she's a New Zealand trained doctor and we found ourselves caught up in the immediate medical response. I was then hired to manage the operations of an international aid charity, rebuilding people's lives and livelihoods. You see the tsunami had devastated the island nation. Its poorer fishing communities in particular lay in absolute ruin. Boats were wrapped around coconut trees up to a kilometre inland. Now aid agencies are familiar enough with the aftermath of disasters to know that livelihoods and incomes are at least as important as health or trauma support or homes. And so one of the first things we did was to commission the building of just under 200 beautiful little boats like these, complete with bright paint, outboard motors, just like the ones the coastal communities had lost. The only thing is they weren't just like the ones people had lost. You see, everyone in boat building had turned their hand to making replacement boats, particularly now that there was tens of millions of dollars pouring into the country. And as soon as the reputable boat builders were at full capacity, the inexperienced or the disreputable guys showed up with their brand new company registrations, the ink still drying on them, dodgy tradesmen trying to make a fast buck. And to make matters worse, we were making boats at one end of the island nation with the help of one ethnic people group and transporting them to the opposite corner of the island to hand over to another ethnic group. These two groups had been at war with each other for the last 22 years. The Sinhalese Buddhists and the Tamil Hindus. Now at times they cooperated despite the war. Not this time. With huge financial incentives driving the boat building business, people cut corners. There was in fact a huge disregard for human life. The boats were entirely unseaworthy. I stood with the marine inspector while he and I unearthed the floors. Simple things. The fiberglass was delaminating. It had been pressed together in such a hurry. All Stainless steel boats, bolts had been swapped out in fixtures and had been swapped with much cheaper steel ones. The trouble is steel rusts at sea. The back plate, you can see it here, it held the motor in place. It's called a transom. It was supposed to be made of aluminium. Instead it was cheap plywood, which absorbed water and swelled. And then the whole back of the boat would shudder beneath the vibration of the motor and eventually rip off and at which point a poor fisherman would have fallen out the back of the boat and undoubtedly drowned, as few of them had ever learned to swim. I watched as a marine inspector failed that bunch of boats on the spot and I knew he was right. I had started my working life as a tradesman, building buses made of fiberglass and steel. We both knew they didn't make the grade. The trouble was, scores of them had already been distributed to communities. That's right, we had just handed over to a disaster-stricken people a bunch of sailing death traps. And so in my first full professional week in the aid industry, I went from coastal village to coastal village, recalling those boats, and I told fishermen with their wives and their children gathered around that we were so sorry for the mess, and I wasn't really sure when I would be back with replacement boats, and the disappointment and dismay on people's faces was palpable. These people's livelihoods depended on them accessing the sea. I left with my tail between my legs, wondering why I had put my hand up to be a professional aid worker. We hadn't done our homework. We didn't know a thing about boat building. We underestimated the ethnic rivalries. We were too eager to get the boats out for another photo op for donors, rather than have them inspected as seaworthy and make sure we took due care of people's lives. In New Zealand, I could have been prosecuted for what we did. 
I had just learnt the first rule in aid work. Good intentions alone aren't enough. The second rule? Even the professional aid agencies get screwed over in a large disaster. Helping those in need is a fantastic thing, but we have to get it right. And sometimes in our eagerness to help, we get in the way of what God is trying to achieve among the poor. So should we help at all? Yes. The Bible is perfectly clear what we have to do in the face of poverty and hardship. And in 1 John, we find all the encouragement we need to help the poor. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister or need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Now, it's a rhetorical question, but it comes with an answer in the very next verse. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Look, we're all guilty at times of offering just words, or worse, theorizing about someone else's poverty, rather than getting on and doing something about it. But before we rush in and act, let's get our theory of poverty straight. That might just help us avoid the worst pitfalls of helping in inappropriate ways. What's a theology of poverty? Well, let's start with a proper understanding of how things are all connected. Brian Myers, in Walking with the Poor, reminds us that we are connected to God, creation, others, and even to our own view of ourselves. But in reality, these are broken connections and they look more like this. Western Christians like us, we tend to define poverty in terms of lacking material things. The poor talk instead about shame, inferiority, powerlessness, a fear, of hu a fear humiliation, hopelessness, social isolation, and being voiceless. Okay, poverty is not just material hardship, it's a bunch of stuff. And in a fallen world, our economic, social and religious and political systems are all fractured. And we are all impoverished because of it. And Myers outlines four interlinking areas of poverty, and starting at the top left here. The poverty of spiritual intimacy, worshipping anything but God our Maker and Sustainer. For example, worshipping material things or vanity, a photo op, perhaps. Moving to the right, a poverty of stewardship. We've lost our purpose as gardeners and, the gardeners and the glorious Garden of Eden. As a result, we're either lazy at one end of the spectrum or we burn ourselves out as workaholics at the other, buried in the pursuit of consumption. Some even believe that the earth is so cursed it's simply not worth tending. Then, a poverty of being. And we have either a low self-esteem or too high an opinion of ourselves. Essentially a God complex, which I'll come to. But this is a particular problem for Western Christians who want to rescue those in poverty. Finally, a poverty of community. And rather than love, it, love our neighbour, what do we do? We look out for number one. Uh, we systematically exploit and abuse poorer neighbours in the process. Look, Tear Fund's partners in poor countries also use such frameworks among the poor. The United Mission of Nepal have framed poverty like this. It's a great model, and at the centre is their life of poverty, uh, and it's marred by self-identity and a poor perception of others. And they identify six facets of life around that wheel where things, are, things can fall apart. Despair and oppression and religious and cultural practices. And just think for a moment, the Hindu caste system and its tendency to oppress those at the bottom. Justice and inequality in political and economic life. Conflict within society. Shame and disrespect in interpersonal relations. Gender equality is, of course, one expression of that. Vulnerability and material hardship, the bit we tend to latch on to first. And then, of course, environmental degradation, not just by locals. And you may have seen the pictures of the discarded detritus rubbish by foreign climbers on the slopes of Mount Everest. That's Nepal today. Now, what should it look like? Well, they say, like this. A colourful, fullness of life model. Living healthy, dignified and hope-filled lives. That's how they frame it. Religious and cultural hope and freedom. Political and economic justice and equality, social cohesion, peace and reconciliation, interpersonal dignity and respect, material well-being and security, there it is, but ecological and environmental sustainability and of course in such a fragile ecosystem at the top of the world. So back to my Sri Lanka context, even if we had just factored in social conflict along ethnic lines, let alone human greed, 
we would have had a much better chance of spotting the problem with our boat building fiasco before it bit the communities we were trying to help. Allowing it to go as far as it did, did nothing to repair or restore those fractured relations. In fact, it only deepened mistrust and compounded Sri Lanka's inequalities. The coastal poor no longer had boats with which to make a livelihood. The dodgy traders had meanwhile made off with a fast buck. And in our speed and our arrogance, we played into the worst of humanity, truly a, a life of poverty, rather than engineering for the best, a fullness of life for all. Now, let me give you one more example of a need that requires some deliberate rethinking. Orphans and vulnerable children. Look, it's been fashionable for many years for churches to support an orphanage somewhere in the world, perhaps to visit the children there from time to time. And let's be dead honest, who doesn't love seeing a smile on a child's face and connecting with that child? But too many, orphans, too many orphanages are sadly not exactly as they seem. Rethink Orphanages is a coalition of charities spanning the globe uh, and it's working to end the separation of children from their families, which they say is sadly at the heart of too many institutional orphanages. And let me just give you one appalling fact that should make us all stop and think. 80% of children in orphanages aren't orphans. I'll repeat that. 80% of children in orphanages are not orphans. They have family who could care for them in the first assistance. And so, um, that's four in five of the estimated 8 million children in orphanages today who have at least one living parent. Why? Well that parent too often gave up that child for money because they were either desperately poor or the payment was just too tempting. And it gets worse. Poor women in some countries are offered payment, payments to get pregnant just to produce one more baby for a lucrative market in orphanages sometimes operating in cahoots with international adoption agencies who pocket payments of up to $20,000 per foreign adoption. Look at Tefan, we think that's borderline human trafficking, that is. Good intentions can in fact do serious harm. And the, the human heart is evil as well as good. Some people do actually willingly exploit children and poor families. Well-meaning foreigners fall into a trap, they're duped or they willingly turn a blind eye. How? by paying to visit or serve in an orphanage. Volunteerism, it's called. And I don't want to judge those who've ever stepped foot in an orphanage here. I want to raise this issue though, um, or with an international adoption. Look, we don't have orphanages in New Zealand anymore, and that's because they are, with the best will in the world, prone to abuse. And at the very least, they lack that individualized love and care that a parent or, or a close community family member gives a child. The corresponding attachment issues are deeply damaging for a child's development. That yearning for attachment is of course why a child will climb all over a young visiting volunteer, but frankly, it's not what they need. There are simply better ways to support poor families and even orphans. Far better to donate to a charity working to support such children and to keep them in place within the extended communities in which they live. So where does this naive approach come from? Well, in the book, When Helping Hurts, the authors say this, and listen, bear with me as I read this. The economically rich often have God complexes, a subtle and unconscious sense of superiority in which they believe they have achieved their wealth through their own efforts and they have been anointed to decide what is best for low-income people whom they view as inferior to themselves. Wow, <laughs> that's worth thinking about. Am I really superior, uniquely blessed by God simply because I won the postcode lottery where I was born in New Zealand and therefore I know best what the poor elsewhere need? Bryant Myers goes on to tell us what we ought to do about such thinking in his book, Walking with the Poor. And I'll read again. The challenge for the non-poor, including the development agency, is to relinquish their God complexes and to employ their gifts for the sake of all human beings rather than using their gifts as a source of power and control. Look, we may have surplus resources. We may even rightly consider ourselves blessed. What we should never do is play God and assume we know best on behalf of the poor. In my experience at Tear Fund, the poor have a pretty good grip on what their lives look like and on the complex web of exploitation and circumstance that have trapped them in poverty. 
Look, they may be beaten down at times and they will be the first to admit that. But time and again, tear fund finds, they have a pretty good idea of what the route out of poverty could look like. And with very little assistance, they latch on to that and they climb that ladder as fast as they can, as you and I would do if we were in their shoes. So what are the components of good Christian community development? Firstly, community driven from the ground up, not from the top down and not from the outside. Secondly, full community participation, including the marginalised, particularly the marginalised. A focus on root causes, what's really driving the hardship and the poverty? And for that, look holistically. Work around a model like the life of poverty, asking the complex questions. Fourth, a sustainable, sustainable programs um, that outlive our involvement. And finally, and it's so simple, serve the poor, not your donors. So really, think in terms of what the poor have, what they don't have. We have a model for this too. We call it an asset-based community development model. Its principles are simple enough. Everyone is created in the image of God with unique gifts. God is present everywhere in communities that we step into. We didn't take him there. He was there long before we got there. Now identify the local strengths and build on those before you go importing foreign technologies and ideas which too often simply don't work and don't stay the course. Build on local hope and local visions for change. And what's that about? Well, that's about ownership, of course. Ownership at the local level. Back to Sri Lanka. After the boat building fiasco, we got smarter. We replaced those boats for one with proper ones and we convinced our donors to pay for them a second time. That was me groveling back to donors going, we got it wrong. And then we went on to employ good development principles in another sector where we gained a considerable amount of expertise. Smallholder dairy farming. That's right, <laughs> call it what you like, dirty dairy. <laughs> you see, the civil war had erupted in Sri Lanka again, and in fact, the sea had become inaccessible to fishermen. Naval patrols would threaten to shoot on sight, and did, anyone found at sea. And so we had to turn our attention back to the land and to land-based livelihoods. Now, they had once been proud dairy farmers, but they'd been driven from their land by war, and now from the sea by a tsunami in their own navy. But you see, if you listen hard enough, you hear what people are really saying. Um, and as the land cleared after fighting in the war, uh, we combined their desire to begin farming again with our funding and, guess what, some specialist New Zealand technical dairy expertise. Well, fast forward to today. Now, after nine years of hard slog, they have a thriving, locally owned dairy enterprise with absolutely stunning results. And let me show you those. Here are the statistics. Uh, it's small on the individual farmer level, but an average household would say one to five cows. Their milk sales have gone up, they've tripled from $61 a month to $174 a month. It's not a lot, but if you combine that with rice farming, which they do as well, that brings them up and over the international poverty line, $1.90 a day per household, sorry, per person. Um, that now pays for schooling, that pays even to get their, university, uh, their children into university, which is not so expensive in a place like Sri Lanka. And because they have 4,500 smallhold farmers and cooperatives, they've traded a whopping 11 million New Zealand dollars in milk sales over the last seven years. They now average 350,000 litres of milk sold per month. 40% of those farmers are women. Many lost their husbands during the Civil War. Running alongside those dairy co-ops are children's clubs, teaching rights, looking after the well-being of children, young farmers, training programs, women empowerment groups that give financial literacy, and they help women overcome the trauma and the abuse of war. And in a country that still buys a huge amount of anchor milk from New Zealand, large quantities, we've been putting power back into the hands of locals. Even Fonterra have been impressed. They've been really supportive. They recently offered us their training farm in Sri Lanka. But perhaps most importantly, this program has brought together those formerly hostile ethnic groups, those groups that were prepared to build dodgy boats at one end of the country and ship them, ship them to the other. They now train together, they learn together, they trade with each other in ways that build trust, build relations, cement peaceful coexistence where they once raked each other's lands in a bloody bitter civil war. We've not got everything right and they're not finished with us. Their current challenge is to wean themselves off their remaining aid funding. Farmers are up and running, but they now need to be more profitable to stand fully on their own two feet. And to achieve that, 
We're helping them to build processing plants and distribution networks so they can graduate from selling large volumes of raw milk to manufacturers to making their own products, yogurt and curd, and selling those in the local market or to supermarkets at a higher price. Unlike the boats, we won't be taking the cows back, and in fact, in most cases, we didn't even buy them. They did. More importantly, they have dignity, they have a viable livelihood, they have peace, and they have a self-directed route out of poverty. We have not done them harm along the way. We're not even so vain as to think that New Zealand did all this, that only we here could possibly know how to dairy farm. This is a uniquely local story, and with the right levels of New Zealand expertise simply blended in to assist. So in summary, to help without hurting, don't play God. Consider the complex web of poverty that we all live in. Join the poor in their search for a route out of poverty and stop and listen long enough to catch hold of their vision, their solutions, and then experience the thrill and the joy, as we have, of walking with them on that journey. Thanks for joining me today.